Hi everybody! So in this video we're going to explore different experiments that you can do with the oriented muscovite mica sheet from Snellius Minerals. This is our first example of a biaxial specimen that we have for sale. And if you'd like some more background on the behavior of biaxial materials, you should check out the video, Optical Mineralogy Biaxial Materials. Many of the experiments we'll take a look at today are classic for optical mineralogy. However, our muscovite has a bit of a complication in that it is monoclinic which means our crystallographic axes and the axes of our optical indicatrix actually don't quite align perfectly. We'll talk about that more later. So here's an example of the oriented muscovite mica sheet from Snellius Minerals. These are fairly thin sheets of muscovite mica that have been cut at very specific angles in order to highlight some optical properties that we're going to take a look at later. These small oriented muscovite sheets are cut from much larger muscovite sheets, and it's pretty cool to actually think about how big these crystals can get. These crystals can get so large, in fact, that people actually used these sheets of muscovite mica as windows back when glass was very expensive. And their use as windows in medieval Russia led to the term Muscovy glass, which is where muscovite is derived from. So if you'd like to follow along with these experiments on your own at home, you can pick up one of these oriented muscovite mica sheets for sale at the eBay store, Snellius Minerals. There will be some other muscovite products there as well, so just make sure to pick out the right one for your purpose. So let's start nerding out about some muscovite mica now, and I always like to start by taking a look at the big picture of what's going on whenever we're examining minerals. Our minerals are defined by their chemistry and structure. This ends up determining the crystallography that we see at the macro scale for our minerals, as well as the optical properties that we see. All these things are linked together. Now our muscovite probably has the most complicated chemistry and most complicated structure of any of the minerals that we've looked at so far. So the chemistry of our muscovite mica consists of potassium, aluminum, silicon, oxygen, and hydroxide. And the structure of our muscovite is that of a TOT dioctahedral sheet silicate with interlayer potassium. Someday I hope to do a deeper dive into the structure and properties of our sheet silicates by making a kit that sort of systematically goes through these. But for today with our muscovite, Let's take a look at a simplified schematic for the muscovite crystal structure. And you can find a more in-depth treatment of this in the Klein and Dutro reference that I'll have at the end of this video in my reference slide. And also Mindat has some good structure models as well. Our muscovite is a TOT dioctahedral sheet silicate. So the TOT portion of that definition is referencing a tetrahedral layer, an octahedral layer, and a tetrahedral layer that are bonded together overall into a bigger layer in our muscovite crystal structure. Here, one of these larger structural units is represented by a blue rectangle. So these TOT sheets are overall composed of aluminum, silicon, oxygen, and hydroxide. And the important thing for us today is to recognize that these structural units are actually bonded together more strongly than the bonding that occurs bridging these structural units, which is caused by potassium ions. So our TOT sheets overall have a negative charge remaining on them. And in order to maintain charge balance in our muscovite crystal structure, what we need are some additional positive charges, and these are provided by our potassium ions. Other ions with single positive charges can also fulfill this role. However, potassium has a very large ionic radius, and so only somewhat strange elements like rubidium can substitute in effectively for potassium. A small amount of sodium can substitute in as well, however, sodium's ionic radius is much smaller, and so the mica equivalent with sodium as the interlayer cation is actually a totally different mineral species known as paragonite. But for today, the big thing to note about our muscovite structure is that the bonding within our TOT structural layers is much stronger than the potassium bonds that tie these layers together, 
This is what ends up giving rise to the cleavage that we'll end up seeing in our muscovite mica. Let's add on some crystallographic axes to our schematic view of our muscovite crystal structure. And now we get to add on a bonus complication that has to do with our TOT structural layers in our muscovite structure. The bonding between the tetrahedral, octahedral, and tetrahedral layers in each TOT sheet actually doesn't fit perfectly. There are a variety of ways this mismatch can actually be accommodated in each TOT sheet, and this gives rise to polytypes. That's a bit too complicated to delve into today, but uh, we're going to go with the most common polytype for muscovite, and that is polytype 2M1. So instead of thinking of our TOT sheets as perfect rectangles, a better representation would be parallelograms. This results in an important change for us. What happens is that our C crystallographic axis is no longer at right angles to our A crystallographic axis. And this is why our muscovite is usually in the monoclinic crystal system. And for this polytype of muscovite, the angle between our A and C crystallographic axes is going to be 95 and a half degrees. Just a note, in an earlier version of this video, I did mess up this simplification of our muscovite crystal structure a bit. Uh, so if you'd seen a previous version of this video, this might be slightly different. And sorry for adding any additional confusion to an already complicated topic. Back to our new and improved simplified muscovite structure model. At this scale, we're thinking about the space group symmetry of our muscovite, which is C 2 over C. Note, however, that the angle between our A and C crystallographic axes isn't too far off from 90 degrees. This is why muscovite can sometimes be misleading and uh, sometimes looks as though it has either orthorhombic or hexagonal symmetry, even when it doesn't, because that angle between the A and C crystallographic axes isn't really that large. So this rather complicated structure results in a space group symmetry of C 2 over C, and the resulting point group symmetry that we'll see for a well-formed muscovite crystal is 2 over M. Let's go back out to our big picture overview of the mineral muscovite. We've talked a bit now about the chemistry and structure of our muscovite along with the space group symmetry that's going on at the micro scale. Some additional important properties of muscovite that we should discuss include its differential hardness. This differential hardness results from the sheet structure of our muscovite. When trying to scratch our muscovite mica on a cleavage surface that only cuts the C crystallographic axis, all we need is a fingernail in order to accomplish this, as the hardness in this direction is two and a half. Trying to scratch our muscovite on a surface parallel to the C crystallographic axis is much more difficult. Uh, the hardness in this direction is up to four. The perfect cleavage of our muscovite along planes that only cut the C crystallographic axis of our muscovite is also a result of the sheet silicate structure of our mineral. The bonding between our potassium interlayer cation and those TOT sheets is weaker than the rest of the bonding in the muscovite structure. As such, when we pull apart mica sheets along this cleavage plane, what we're doing is breaking apart those potassium to TOT sheet bonds. Potassium, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Whether it's the differential hardness or the perfect cleavage in the muscovite structure, hopefully it makes sense that the sheet silicate structure of our muscovite is causing a great deal of anisotropy with its properties. We should also mention that muscovite isn't a particularly dense mineral. The density varies between 2.76 and 2.88 grams per cubic centimeter. And this variability in density, much like the variability in our refractive indices, is caused by the limited solid solution series that can occur within muscovite. So for our muscovite, some of our interlayer potassium can be swapped out with uh, sodium. There can also be substitutions of fluorine for hydroxide, and there's also more complex coupled substitutions involving silicon, aluminum, magnesium, and sometimes iron. And there's also some other minor substitutions that can occur in this structure as well. 
Let's take a look at one of our oriented muscovite sheets now and see if we can learn something about its crystallography. The main thing to note when looking at our muscovite is that we really are seeing a flat sheet of the mineral here in this view. And if we think about our point group symbol of 2 over m for our monoclinic muscovite, what that 2 over m symbol means is that our B crystallographic axis is going to be a twofold rotational axis and it's going to have a mirror plane perpendicular to it. So let's just go hunt down our twofold rotational symmetry element and we'll be set, right? However, the shape of our oriented muscovite sheet is not natural. These edges have all been cut by me, and so there's no reason, at least no reason yet, to believe that these edges have any crystallographic relevance at all. So what we're left with is one really good clue about crystallographic orientation, and that's the sheet-like nature of our muscovite. And these very flat sheets of muscovite mica occur because of the cleavage planes in our muscovite. And these cleavage planes cut only the C crystallographic axis of our muscovite. And I don't want you just to believe me that we're looking down onto one of these cleavage planes. So, instead, we're going to stab our muscovite with this hobby knife to show off that perfect cleavage of our muscovite. Warning, I am not liable for stab wounds if you try this at home, and also, you might not want to try this with your nicely oriented muscovite sheet. Let me just, uh, have this one make the sacrifice for us all. Also, this goes a bit easier than it will if you try this at home, as I, I tried this earlier with this same specimen, only got about halfway through, and then dropped it like I just did there. Uh, so this, uh, this is a little easier second time round. Uh, but the cleavage of our muscovite mica really is quite impressive how perfect it is. And the perfect cleavage that we see here gives us information on the crystallographic direction that we're looking through our muscovite. While we're here in this view, let's also check out that differential hardness of our muscovite mica that we were talking about. In this direction, I should be able to scratch our muscovite just with a fingernail, and we can see here that is indeed the case. Uh, once again, this is kind of a destructive thing to do, so probably don't do this with your nicely oriented muscovite sheet. Let's go back to our original image of the muscovite sheet. And let's think about what this cleavage surface is telling us crystallographically. We've also got our simplified muscovite structure model, and we know that the cleavages are occurring where the potassium ions are located in this structure model. The way this works out is that our cleavage plane only cuts the C crystallographic axis. When we look at one of these muscovite cleavage sheets in this orientation, what we're actually looking at is the plane of the A and B axes. Let's take a look at how the crystallographic axes are set up for our monoclinic crystal system to make a bit more sense out of this. The C axis and A axis of our mineral are going to lie together in a plane that is perpendicular to the B crystallographic axis. However, the angle between the C axis and the A axis is not 90 degrees. So we're getting a bit complicated with our crystallographic axis orientations here with the monoclinic crystal system. And specifically for the crystal class 2 over M, our B axis is going to be a twofold rotational axis with a perpendicular mirror plane. The A and C crystallographic axes are lying in the same plane as that perpendicular mirror plane. Usually, when thinking about the orientation of crystals in the monoclinic crystal system, we have the C axis be vertical and the A axis dip down into the front. But for our muscovite today, what will actually be more helpful is thinking about what's going on when our A axis is horizontal. And this means our C crystallographic axis will be at an angle to vertical. Specifically for muscovite, 5.5 degrees, as the angle between our A and C crystallographic axes is 95.5 degrees. Let's go back out to our simplified muscovite structure model. And hopefully that A, B, and C crystallographic axis makes a bit more sense now. And so thinking about our crystallographic orientations and cleavage, when we're actually looking down on one of the cleavage planes of our muscovite, what we're seeing is the A and B plane. And when we establish where the A and B crystallographic axes are, 
Then we also know the location of the C crystallographic axis, as it is at right angles to our B crystallographic axis and at 95 and a half degrees from the A crystallographic axis. The problem that we run into now is that even though we know we're looking at the AB plane of our Muscovite, we don't actually know where those A and B crystallographic axes are located. For all we know currently, they could be rotated like this. We need more crystallographic information, and there's two interesting ways to get this. One of these is very destructive and involves hitting things with a hammer, and the other one, as you may have guessed from my love of optical mineralogy, involves optics. Let's start by hitting things with a hammer. So if you take a small, thin sheet of muscovite mica, and you hit this sheet just right with a semi-blunt instrument like the peen end of a ball-peen hammer, you can generate what's known as a percussion figure, and this gives us actually all sorts of crystallographic information. Here is what one of these percussion figures look like. Um, it is reproducible to do this, however, you kind of have to get lucky with being precise with your hammer strikes. I have sacrificed many a tiny muscovite flake in the furtherance of generating these two pretty good percussion figures. With the percussion figure, I want you to notice this pattern of fractures that we have occurring in our muscovite. And this pattern that we're seeing is crystallographically controlled. This is giving us information on the crystallography of our muscovite, and it just so happens that one of the sets of these fractures is going to be perpendicular to our B crystallographic axis. We know that the A and B crystallographic axes are going to lie in this plane because of the cleavage of our muscovite, and our B crystallographic axis and the perpendicular mirror plane that contains the A crystallographic axis are going to end up lying here. And once we've figured out the location of our B and A crystallographic axes, we also know the location of our C crystallographic axis because of its relationship to the A and B crystallographic axes. You may be wondering how I managed to pick that set of fractures as the orientation guide for our B crystallographic axis, and the answer is I, uh, I cheated and used optics. Uh, so uh, may maybe let's go talk about optics now. But first, back out to the big picture. We talked about the chemistry and structure of our muscovite, and how we can use cleavage and percussion figures in order to orient fragments of muscovite crystallographically. The complex chemistry and structure of our muscovite also means that the optical properties of our muscovite are going to be more complicated than the optical properties of minerals that we've looked at before. And so there will be three refractive indices that we want to think about here, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. And the values of these refractive indices have some variability based on some limited solid solution substitutions that can occur in the muscovite structure. So let's take a quick look at the optical indicatrix for muscovite, which is a three-dimensional representation of the refractive indices of our muscovite. For simplicity, I chose the lowest values for our refractive indices for our muscovite, but note that these are actually ranges based on things like solid solution. Here we have three different important views of the optical indicatrix for our muscovite. This shape is exaggerated for demonstration purposes, but our muscovite optical indicatrix is going to be a triaxial ellipsoid. And the axes of this ellipsoid are going to consist of our refractive indices alpha, beta, and gamma. And the directions through this ellipsoid are referred to as x, y, and z, which are associated with alpha, beta, and gamma. If you want to learn more about biaxial materials and their optical indicatrices, you should check out the video Optical Mineralogy Biaxial Materials. Our muscovite is going to be biaxial negative which means that refractive index beta is closer to refractive index gamma than it is to refractive index alpha. Our biaxial muscovite is going to have two optic axes perpendicular to circular sections through the optical indicatrix. And these circular sections have a radius of refractive index beta. The angle between our two optic axes is going to vary for muscovite between 30 and 47 degrees, this is in part due to the variability in the refractive indices of our muscovite. 
Let's also mark where our optic axes emerge. In our view in the upper left, uh, we can do this with two stars. This will be important later. And let's also label our different views of our optical indicatrix for the interference figures that they would generate. All right, so this is pretty much all the information we're going to need when thinking about our optical indicatrix for our Muscovite. There's a lot going on there. But now we have to add in another layer of complication. I'll first remove a bit of information to make this a bit tidier, and now we have to think about how our crystallography and our crystallographic axes line up with our optical indicatrix. Our muscovite is monoclinic, and this means that only one of our crystallographic axes is going to line up with one of the axes of our optical indicatrix. For muscovite, the B crystallographic axis aligns with the Z direction through our optical indicatrix, which is associated with refractive index gamma. Our C crystallographic axis varies between 0 and 5 degrees off of our X direction through our optical indicatrix, and our A crystallographic axis varies between 1 and 3 degrees off of our Y direction through our optical indicatrix. Remember, the angle between our A and C crystallographic axes is 95 and a half degrees. So here is a representation of how our crystallographic axes and our optical indicatrix line up. And as you can see, this is a bit complicated. It's much easier to talk about an orthorhombic mineral like cordierite, where all of our crystallographic axes and the axes of our optical indicatrix line up. But there's an important point to be made here, and that's that the optics are related to the symmetry of the structure of the mineral we're looking at. And that's why only the B crystallographic axis of our muscovite aligns with one of the axes of our optical indicatrix. It's because the B crystallographic axis is the twofold symmetry element in the structure of our muscovite. Remember, the chemistry and structure of our mineral control the crystallography and the optical properties, and all of these things are tied together. Now that we've looked at the optical indicatrix for our muscovite, we can simplify things a bit because we know that we're looking down onto the plane of the A and B crystallographic axes when we're looking at our cleavage surface of our muscovite. And none of our current views of our optical indicatrix exactly match this orientation of our muscovite. However, the view in the upper left is within 5 degrees of what we're looking for. Let's focus on this view for a moment. So when we're looking down the X direction through our optical indicatrix, what we'll actually see is the gamma beta plane of our mineral. And because our muscovite is biaxial negative in this plane, we're going to actually generate a BXA interference figure. That's an acute bisectrix interference figure. And the optic axes of our muscovite are going to be located approximately where the stars are in this figure. Once again, the 2V angle of our muscovite has some variability, as do the refractive indices of our muscovite. So if we're viewing our muscovite while it lies on a cleavage surface, this is the view of our optical indicatrix we're almost looking at. As there is some variability in the angle between the X direction of our optical indicatrix and our C crystallographic axis, as well as the Y direction of our optical indicatrix and our A crystallographic axis, the actual view through our optical indicatrix in this orientation is going to be slightly different. And here's a possible representation of that view depending on exactly those angles between our directions of our optical indicatrix and our crystallographic axes. So you can imagine we've rotated our optical indicatrix just slightly. We can still see refractive index gamma. However, refractive index beta has been replaced with refractive index alpha prime. Alpha prime being a value somewhere in between alpha and beta. However, alpha prime is going to be very close to beta as we've only moved a few degrees away. We should still be able to generate a pretty good almost BXA interference figure though with just that slight rotation. Now let's take a look at our oriented muscovite sheet and translate all our theoretical understanding of the optical indicatrix into practice. So here we have our oriented muscovite sample, and we're currently viewing this with transmitted plane polarized light. 
We'll first rotate the sample in plane polarized light to see if we can observe any pleochroism. These samples do all vary just a little bit. Uh, for the most part, you can see a very slight bit of pleochroism as we rotate these. Uh, sometimes I have to rotate them a bit quicker in order to actually see the difference. And it's a bit hard to tell uh, with my camera changing its lighting levels as well. So the possibility exists of ever so slight pleochroism with these. However, the fun really begins when we bring in our upper polarizer and view our sample with cross polarizers. As we begin to rotate our sample, what you'll notice is the generation of an interference color. This interference color reaches a maximum brightness at 45 degrees from our starting position. And in our next video, we're going to use some mica to really explore the generation of interference colors. But for right now, know that the interference color results from the thickness of our sample and the birefringence of our sample in this view, and the interference color observed, the thickness of our sample, and the birefringence of our sample are all tied together by an equation. So if you know any two of the three items, you can actually figure out the third. As we continue to rotate the muscovite specimen, you should also notice that the extinction positions of our muscovite line up with the edges that I've cut into our oriented muscovite samples. Let's generate an interference figure for our muscovite. And the best place to start with generating our interference figure is to first position our muscovite so that its interference color is at its maximum brightness. And we then bring in a converging lens in order to generate our interference figure. What we're seeing here is a pretty good, almost BXA interference figure. And this confirms for us that the optics of our muscovite are indeed biaxial. Let's take a moment and label the different parts of our interference figure. So the melatopes in our interference figure are the locations where the optic axes are actually located, and these will remain at extinction and become a bit more apparent when we rotate our crystal later on. The different bands of color that we see are known as isochromes. Where we see the same color, we're seeing equal birefringence as light travels through our sample. The last remaining feature are dark bands of extinction known as isogyres. These dark bands of extinction are generated by the vibrational directions of our upper and lower polarizers and will rotate around our melatopes when we rotate our muscovite sample later on with this same viewing configuration. In this moment, we've also now gathered enough information that we can fully understand the orientation of our muscovite sheet using a combination of crystallography and the optical properties that we're seeing right now. We know that when we're looking down onto one of these flat sheets of muscovite, that we're looking onto the plane of the A and B crystallographic axes of our muscovite. And we know how the optical properties of our muscovite stack up in this viewing direction. While this view of our muscovite doesn't align perfectly with a BXA figure, it's still close enough that we can use this information in order to orient our sample. So if we know where the melatopes are in our interference figure, we also know where our B crystallographic axis must lie. Using our combination of the crystallography of the cleavage planes of our muscovite mica to find the plane of the A and the B axes, and then our optical properties in order to pin down exactly where the B crystallographic axis is, we've now fully oriented our muscovite mica sample and we can add on our C crystallographic axis as well as we know where it must lie given its relationship to our A and B crystallographic axes. The C crystallographic axis will be perpendicular to our B crystallographic axis and inclined at 95 and a half degrees from our A crystallographic axis. So that is the most important part of what we were doing today, using a combination of crystallography and optical properties in order to understand the orientation of our muscovite sample. But let's take a look at the almost BXA figure and how it behaves as we rotate our muscovite crystal. The behavior of our interference figures for our biaxial minerals are much more interesting than the uniaxial minerals. Here I've reset our viewing setup just a little bit so that I can more freely rotate our muscovite crystal. 
And as we rotate the specimen, pay particular attention to the movement of the isogyres. When identifying an unknown substance, being able to generate a BXA interference figure lets us know that the material must be biaxial, and that we're either looking down onto the gamma beta plane or the alpha beta plane of our material. Back out to the big picture for today, the chemistry and structure of our mica control the crystallography and optical properties of our mica, and we can use a combination of those crystallographic and optical properties in order to orient our muscovite mica appropriately. You may wonder why anyone would care to do this. However, muscovite actually has some industrial applications. The sheet structure of our muscovite makes it an excellent electrical and thermal insulator. In order to maximize these insulating properties, however, we have to orient our muscovite crystals appropriately. All right, let's go through a brief review of what we've done today. We talked about the chemistry and structure of our muscovite mica and how our muscovite is a monoclinic mineral. We talked about how the cleavage of muscovite is a very prominent crystallographic feature. However, you can also generate a percussion figure which gives you additional crystallographic information for your muscovite. We then investigated the optical indicatrix for our muscovite, which is a three-dimensional representation of the refractive indices of our muscovite. For our monoclinic minerals, the axes of our optical indicatrix and our crystallographic axes do not align perfectly, and for muscovite, only the B crystallographic axis and the Z direction through our optical indicatrix line up. However, the C crystallographic axis isn't too far away from our X direction through our optical indicatrix, this is useful to us when we examine the optical properties of our muscovite mica using a polariscope, and the resulting almost BXA figure that we generate here allows us to identify the location of the B crystallographic axis. So remember that our muscovite is defined by its chemistry and structure. These in turn determine the crystallography that we can see macroscopically as well as the optical properties of our muscovite mica. If you'd like to try out these experiments on your own, you can pick up the oriented mica sheet from the eBay store, Snellius Minerals. Check out some of the other nerdy minerals while you're there as well. And if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please feel free to reach out at the email sneliusminerals at gmail.com. Here are the references that were used in the construction of the video today. Our next video is going to explore in depth the generation of interference colors. Here's a link to that video. Thanks again for watching, and have a great day.